once again take a trip back into the distant mists of April with your host, Doc Edo. This week we'll have episode 30 coming courtesy of Inyokal, and then I will be resuming current episodes beginning with 31. Thanks again to my intrepid comrade for stepping up. And now, up, up, and up some more for episode 26 of the Civ Battle Royale X Season 3, The Age of Air. The cylinder is never without innovation, but at this time we witness one of the biggest yet, as death rains upon some unfortunate denizens of the Civ Battle Royale. I'm your host, ECH, still doing my dumb little stats and history posts. When I was last here, Kilwa was being sworn to destruction, so much for that, and Duckmen walked the lands. Strange times. Last episode may have been one of the most hype we've seen here and I can only hope this one keeps up the pace. Hot tip, if you ever want to reminisce a bit on the earlier days of the CBR, bring up the current Varea map and the one from however far you want back, and flip between the tabs. I've got last episodes and episode 15's up. Man, the cylinder looks better with all the empty spots filled up. While it's also remarkable how little the Arapaho have shifted. While I do want to give a huge shout-out to Nerosat, whose new war wheel I reference a few times during this write-up, they got the spotlight last time, so let's rotate it with our reliable favorite, Orange Chrissy's American Dream series. This time we get a flavor of how Pretty Nose may be interpreting and implementing a radical definition of neutrality. Foreshadowing? A big old thanks to everyone who donates, as always. Keeping the lights on, the ships afloat, the taps running, yada yada yada, you know what it means and that you're appreciated. The Mojave have topped the power rankings for the first time, breaking the stranglehold Tuva and Turkey have had on the prime position ever since episode 8. No doubt boosted through their impressive science showings and impressive land holdings from the Central Pacific to Honduras. Let's see if Irataba can maintain this lead or even strike against a foe to expand it further. We begin with a shot of the scattershot Antarctic outposts that lie south of the vast Pacific, mostly occupied at this time by a Chilean squadron, perhaps the backdoor variety? They're only at war with the eliminated Kwakwakuwaku, so I doubt they're doing much more than aimless drifting. Please also spare a thought for the forever homeless Yongu Lipa Lipas, who I imagine as oceanic nomads, hopping from tiny island to tiny island. Staying in the southernmost reaches, we gaze over the islands east of South America, ruled over by Chile and Rio de la Plata. Chile probably would have taken all of these islands if the last war had lasted longer, to my memory. And should Chile make the obviously beneficial choice to declare war again, I expect they would sweep up quite quickly still. Allende was ranked pretty low in the first place due to a pacifist reputation, and although he surprised us once, he really shouldn't pass up the opportunity to impress us again, while Rio de la Plata is also facing the Inca and Cayapo. Tensions between America and Castile have remained tense ever since the U.S. intervention in Burgos a number of episodes ago, and last week that boiled over into another declaration of war, this time with longer-lasting mainland intentions for the Americans. The totalitarian press apparatus run by the fascist ideologues in Washington even concocted a bogus story about a Spanish mine destroying a ship called the USS Manila, Experts in the future will doubt Isabella possessing the technology to do such a thing. Whatever the reason, Leon has been brought into red very fast, with the Spanish resorting to their cultural tradition of throwing horse units into the water to slow down enemy ships. At least the conquistador UU has bonus embarked defense, I guess? My prediction, plenty of flips, with the victor depending on how many extra melee ships FDR is prepared to send over.
I know we have some meaty war content here, but first, ding ding ding, we have our first spotted great scientist. For those not aware, the CBR AI pretty much always immediately pops GSs for the science boost, making it rare to even see one, much less catch their name. However, here we spot Subramanian Chandraskar, presumably quite happy to avoid the bloody front lines, searching for an observatory to continue his groundbreaking research into the evolution of stars. Anyway, probably more importantly for our purposes, Kokang has dealt an early blow in the partition of Indonesia, taking the large city of Cavite el Viejo in a grand display of the power of air superiority. Seriously, if you checked the last episode, two turns ago the city had no damage, and Yang had just four planes in the region. I'd imagine this is Yang's main war aim, besides the Philippines, and it will vastly improve the position for a future elimination of Cambodia. Elsewhere, it seems Batambang has emerged as the target of an Indonesian counteroffensive. We'll see how that develops. Yemen proves that they're not going to be stopped by one tile of land as they land a decent force on Madagascar to take another city off of the Zulu. Operational Commander Yves-Joseph de Kurgulin Tremarc can take pride in his work, although his real passion is exploration, not warfare. Perhaps after this he'll sail south and see if he can find anything new that Bengal hasn't already settled down there. In another reality, he would be lauded as a hero for discovering the Kurgulin Islands before being fired after his second voyage revealed how useless they were. On the topic of African campaigns, that is a fair amount of manpower Timor-Leste seems to be sending to their Zulu war. On one hand, this could give them a good foothold on another continent, and Setshwayo is certainly not a difficult opponent. But on the other hand, I might question the choice to commit to this now during a region-defining war with Indonesia. Unsurprisingly, Leon has fallen. And holy cannoli, FDR is definitely planning on keeping it, given that reinforcement wave. The pendulum has swung hard towards Castile being a one-city rump by the end of this episode, but a lucky piece or naval bungling is never out of the cards. The period of the cylinder from the late 1800s to the mid-1900s saw just about every advanced state adopt a more comprehensively packaged ideological system of governance that tied together laws, socio-cultural practices, and citizenship. With a global environment so focused on warfare and eternal leaders presiding over everything, ideologies that leaned authoritarian or downright totalitarian naturally led the way, and communism, with its collective spirit and flexibility in interpretation, established itself as the dominant global order. However, that flexibility in interpretation means communist civs have zero issues finding fault with each other, and warfare is certainly not hindered between comrades, as this new joint war of the Inca and Han on Kokang demonstrates. Perhaps this is a response to Yang siding with the non-communist Timorese against communist Indonesia under Suharto? Perhaps this is rooted in the nationalist horde government Han currently has, according to the top left. Or perhaps this is just opportunity knocking, as Kokang has its forces mounted southward, leaving their Pacific outposts and Chinese frontier open to both civs. In any case, I expect this won't be a walk in the park for anyone, and... Honestly, I could see this backfiring on Wu. From the moment he felt his existence begin on this cylinder, Tupac Yupanqui, while certainly feeling right and happy to settle and conquer the vast highlands of the Andes region, always felt an additional yearning to spread his influence over the ocean that lay at his empire's shores. Well, he's certainly delivered on that desire plenty already, and with this new war, he has a decent chance to expand it further, provided the Incan Pacific fleet actually heads there. Interestingly, in spite of the Pacific setting, this is a war not just on the sea now, but the airways. Both Kokang and the Inca boast new and shiny airfields, presumably learning the early techniques of bombing and strafing targets. Once again, blood is spilled across Luzon as the city of Malolos, once a grand capital city, 
faces another siege. To be fair, I'm not sure which I'd rather have, between the slow decline of a decades-long medieval starve-out or the terror of explosive bombardment and blitz tactics. Kokang might want to watch out that they actually have a unit to capture the city before they bomb it into total oblivion, as it seems Timor-Leste could easily end up the beneficiary if they aren't careful. We jump to the Irish Isles, stepping back an era or two in terms of military tech. That doesn't diminish the excitement in any way, though, as William III seems keen to knock back his many detractors in the community at least a little. Plus, much like Yupanki's yearning for the Pacific, something just feels right about this whole invade that island across from us idea. Of course, his government doesn't frame this as cynical revanchism, but claims this is in fact an invited revolution by the oppressed majority Lutherans of Rotterdam and other minority Lutherans across Ireland. Furthermore, the Anglo-Dutch have put their Blue Guard riflemen and man-of-war frigates on a pedestal, but for my money, the Artillery Corps deserve the real recognition right now, effortlessly bombarding Wexford and Kilkenny into defeat. Going further into Collins' domain isn't impossible, but may be a bit more difficult, especially as the Irish have responded to this invasion by raising their own defensively inclined riflemen UU in Cork, nationalists ready to fight and die for their homeland, known as Fanians, well-timed as they gain bonus strength for each defensive building when near enough to their cities. Displeased with the bizarre lack of progress his army is currently making against Zagreb's defenses, Freddie W. has doubled down on his great musician morale boost strategy, patronizing an up-and-comer romantic composer from the borderlands being fought over, Franz Liszt whose astounding flood of original works and skyrocketing popularity is sure to install Lizd mania in the troops. Now he just needs to team up with Aretha Franklin, and surely Zagreb shall be in their hands. That being said, Brandenburg would perhaps have been better served researching dynamite based on this slide, as a look at the info spreadsheet reveals they still lack that technology and are currently skipping ahead to flight. Tito is taking great advantage of this for the moment, although he may want to secure some buffer troops before long. Down in the southernmost reaches of Africa, Sechuayo's attempt to take back Saroe seems to have largely failed, if anything, just eating up troops needed to defend against this unexpected threat from across the Indian Ocean. Of course, with two targets to split up attackers, the Timorese Angolan naval attacks could fail. But with the tech disparity, the chances of Nongoma or Eshoe glowing red and yellow soon isn't hard to see. Historians will forever debate why such a large contingent of Pandian frigate divisions sat at anchor in the Bay of Bengal while Afghanistan's army swept through the cities and destroyed the civilization they served. Corruption? A traitorous admiralty? Mutinous crews hoping to avoid a hopeless fight and fleeting death? Afghan sabotage of the communication channels? Whatever the case, the end result wasn't pretty for these sailors, as those that didn't stealthily steal the rowboats and flee to Bengali refugee camps were left to perish against the modern metallic warships in an infamous series of clashes off the coast of Kodura Malai, a distinctly merciless last stand for a sieve so poorly performing as Pandya. As Afghanistan pacifies and rebuilds the lands they just took, just a bit north, an architect named Charles Barry has derived inspiration from the far-off culture of the Normans, building a great number of palaces, gardens, and even main government buildings in an ornate Normanite style. As if that didn't sound peaceful enough, you might want to check the minimap. Indeed, peace is declared in Iberia. It seems Castile has seen the writing on the wall and has decided to skip the dozens of turns of whittling flips, instead just handing Leon over to the Americans at four pop. I suppose Isabella can take solace that she's still doing better than her neighbor on the Costa Brava, and honestly, she ought to consider declaring war even, what with the Roberts forces already grinding Tetuan down.
Fresh from their elimination of Pandya, Afghanistan's army has marched back up to their front with the Permians, hoping to swipe back Sare Pol and Lashkargah. Now, the Permians do offer stronger resistance than Pandya, and probably would have even less problems if only there wasn't a Lithuanian peacekeeping force dividing their army in half. We really are getting some hallmarks of late game CBR popping up now. Back in Europe, Kilkenny is taken without any nearby melee units to take it back, and Wexford should fall next turn. If Michael aims to send a counterattack from Ireland or Scotland, he better hurry up before the Orange Army, not meant as a reference toward a particular set of IRL nasties, although the historical allusion is strong, organizes upwards. You may also note Tralee remaining in a perpetual state of ownership fluctuation, as Greenland's navy and Irish land units ping-pong back and forth. The Moiska, far from a position of total strength, enter into the prevailing influences of the Cylinder Communist International, which I imagine to be as harmonious a body as a boxing center. I recall the last time I had the reins as narrator, Nemequene was at a peak of relevance, taking on and nearly holding Central America's capital, alongside grabbing some rogue island outposts in the Caribbean. I noted then that a war was sure to begin at some point between America and the Moisca for regional naval control. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Even with the tech disparity, it may be one of their best options to regain momentum at this point, relying on privateer swarms, but equally an assault on the Inca could be worth a shot. In any case, the current trajectory is a surefire pathway to the meh section of the history books, so they better think fast. A report back on developments in the Zulu conflicts shows that Timor-Leste has indeed split their navy, but that may not even matter in terms of conquering Ashoa. With the city at half health and more reinforcements arriving, the possibility of a red Cape of Good Hope steadily rises, precluding Angolan or Yemeni sniping. Attempting to spread hope and raise morale from the balcony of government offices in Jakarta before a justifiably worried public, Praetor Suharto declares that Indonesia has never been at a greater stage of advancement and has certainly entered the modern age. Of course, these are cheap words for those who have family trapped in Palembang, desperately seeking passage to safer areas of Indonesia before the nationalist Timorese army are marching through the city's main streets, or simply to those that fear the next target after Palembang will be Jakarta itself. Elsewhere, Batambang remains under siege, but curiously, mostly by embarked units. And Pasig takes its first licks also. Finally, as Nirosat's web of war reminded me before this writing, Afghanistan is still at war with Indonesia also, and actually has a navy arriving to distract and damage Suharto further. Oh dear. The notifications across the top of the screen inform me that Afghanistan straight up charged into Midnapore with the fleet we saw last slide. That's some impressive sailing, although in retrospect a 29 defense city versus three destroyers is fairly bad at this point. Here in Central Asia, they likewise have stormed back into Sare Pol with a fair amount of ease, although the Permians certainly have the troops to create a back and forth for a while. Still, both William III earlier and Durrani here are showing the power of a strong artillery line, it seems. Not much that needs to be said here, just confirmation that Midnapore fell and, in my estimation, won't be returning to Indonesia without some military diverting. Now, will Surabaya be the next recipient of Afghan shelling? The Ming have not been having the best time as of late. I don't think anyone could deny, especially when sitting in their glorified trading post at the bottom of Japan, Kaifeng. But when the ever boastful great leader of North Korea declares that treasure fleets are an abomination of capital and the Ming should hand over all their riches to us in penance, Yongle can't take that lying down. And the Ming-Korean War begins.
They do have some technological advantages on their side, especially in terms of frigates versus galleys, but Juju is a big bluff on access, and even beyond that, North Korea has plenty of carpet to lay in front of Ming troops, so I could see this going slow. What a surprise! Tralee has flipped, once again. Given Greenland's fleet off to the left, I do hope Collins is feverishly in peace negotiations now, because it looks to me like in an endurance race, Agede will run a lap or two in his priest's smock. Honestly, more surprising than the flipping is the lack of conquest Wexford has undergone. Come on, Willie, don't fumble at the gold. I'm a bit confused about something, sir says one corporal to his officer in a Great War infantry unit camped outside the newly occupied Catamarca. State your query, soldier, barks the officer. Where exactly are all the trees? Been wondering that since we marched south of South Salvador. Like, people need jungle to feed themselves in research, don't they? The corporal asks, joined by a chorus of agreements and murmurs from around the camp by fellow squaddies. A single tear starts falling down the officer's face. Sometimes, child, you never know how good you had it until you leave home. In terms of game analysis, Kayapo looks as strong as ever on this front, taking one of Rio de la Plata's four core cities and in position to take Salta next. As if things weren't bad enough, the Inca, very much late to the party, have finally sent some troops over the Andes near Tucumán. One turn on from the last view of this scene, and Wexford is indeed taken. The Anglo-Dutch can, for the first time, say that they've fully realized both the Anglo and Dutch aspect of their names, as they now hold at least 90% of real-life England. Just put aside that chunk of the Netherlands Brandenburg has citadeled. All they had to do was slaughter lots of Irish folk who follow a different religion. Who knew? Despite existing at separate ends of the Asian continent, Ataturk, Blumenkagan, and their respective peoples have always sensed an odd linkage between each other, a fact that has baffled many an anthropologist of the cylinder. So when it came time to fully define their administrative values, it was only natural for the Gokturks to follow their far-off communist cultural cousin and raise the red flag. They should definitely start recruiting some new people's battalions, however. They are looking so much more pressed in and weaker than I expected following Han's invasion. I have to imagine future history nuts will enjoy and maybe even make memes out of this point in South American history. Jose's Folly. That time when the outdated but spirited forces of the Pampas Plains rose up and defeated the distracted Incan tyrants in Machu and Sao Salvador with a ragtag spirit, reclaiming a sense of national pride, if only for a few years, before a modern coalition brutally swept down on their hopes and dreams. Another major blow has been dealt as Salta Falls and GWI start approaching Buenos Aires. Somewhere in the sub's dormitory, Solano Lopez stares at the lounge TV screen and starts sobbing tears of joy and homesickness. In this latest news report on the Ming-Korean War, we have nothing new to report. Seriously, Yongle, your street rep can't sustain itself. I suppose this is as good a time as any to note the state of Mori and their defensive war with the Gokturks, which seems similarly stagnant. It looked like they may have been in trouble for a moment last episode, but the Turkic advance has stumbled and those Murakami Kobaya Caravel UUs, quick reminder, they heal on trade routes and improvements and get plus 10 strength for each land tile they border, seem to be holding up well enough with plenty of coast. Tupac Yupanqui clearly hasn't been following my exquisite tactical advice, as the attack on Chan Ti Ai seems to have sputtered out without additional support, with only a few ships left floating and, I imagine, 
plenty of loose driftwood washing ashore. So, I'm starting to think we may all have been misunderstanding the nature of this particular war. Based on that big wave of embarked units and ships, Zulu observation posts are probably starting to panic about on the horizon. This is not just some accidental conflict Timor-Leste stumbled into and luckily grabbed an easy city with some spare ships, but a concerted attack on a weak link in the chain fence that is Seabrix 3's Africa. Eshoe has fallen already, and Nongoma looks soon to follow, albeit with some units nearby that could contest matters. The two big questions left are this. How high are Gusmao's ambitions, and how capable is Sechuayo of holding back the tide? A matter of production numbers and tactical ability. As some officials and soldiers roll off the destroyers harbored in newly taken Palembang, the main group of forces are sent to the central target of this entire conflict, the island of Java and its capital, Jakarta. With infantry landed, a sliver of health already taken, and the main Indonesian fleet seemingly more focused on Batambang, which, to be fair, has fallen to yellow, I don't envy the chances of the Jakarta garrison. Meanwhile, Midnapore looks to have continually flipped for a while, and Surabaya also has had a small bit of its health gnawed at. A very small silver lining in times of conflict can be the artistic explosions they unleash, perhaps expressed best in the fittingly situated Amrita Shergil, an avant-garde prodigy from the early 20th century professing Indian, Jatsik, and Hungarian Jewish heritage blending those cultural influences together in her art until her tragically early death at 28. However, while Yugoslavia is making a cultural stride, Brandenburg makes a scientific one as they finish researching flight and already have 10 aircraft deployed. If the bulk of those planes turn out to be bombers, the realities of the battleground could turn sharply in the Germans' favor. Turkey, not content with just possessing aircraft, cruisers, and landships, decide to top off their military modernization with the Kuvayi Milie. Much like the Irish Fanians earlier, in a non-cylinder reality, these were the names of the nationalist militias that successfully fought for their homeland's independence in the 1910s. Hell, the British were a prime opponent of both forces. In game terms, they're a GWI replacement that start weaker, but get drill one, 50% more strength from generals, and are free to upgrade into infantry, which ties into Turkey gaining yields from upgrading. That peacekeeping force must have done something to help negotiations, as just after Afghanistan loses Sar Epol again, both sides agree to a peace deal. Both the Permians and Afghanistan clearly had the troops to keep up a fight, but honestly, this is probably for the best, regardless of who you support. If you're backing Azike, the ever-present Sword of Damocles over their head, that is Tuva, means you probably don't want them throwing away troops over one-pop cities. And if you're Durrani supporters, you probably also feel that they spent too much time building this army to lose it here. In one turn, Suharto retakes Midnapore and Palembang, and seemingly is bringing more of his 18th century navy towards Jakarta, as would make sense. I have doubts that either of these counterattacks will last long, and that extra contingent of Afghan ships coming east is not good news for Suharto at all, but it's still a sign that Indonesia is not just lying down to die. Have you noticed that this is our first shot of North America in the entire episode, nearly halfway through? The community may be in agreement that Africa is the weak continent this season, but for my money, North America is the sleeper this time around. But hey, at least there should be a good few barracks to sleep in, with the amount of citadels FDR and his military cabinet have ordered built, encroaching deeper and deeper towards Julianhab. A 
captured squad of Arapaho Beni Nen fearfully sit, tied up, in a cage at the center of a rebel infantry camp. Some of the fighters whip their heads around as the extremist insurgent commander, adorned in red uniform and known only to the good citizens of nearby towns as Captain Brannigan, saunters out of his tent alongside a meekish aide. I hate these filthy neutrals, Jif, the captives hear him yell, before his head turns toward the cage and they all avert their gaze. With enemies, you know where they stand, but with neutrals, who knows? It sickens me. The aide sighs as his commander stomps over to the prisoners, pointing at one, and with a cruel tone, shouting, You there! Tell me! What makes a sieve turn neutral? Lust for gold? Power? Or were you all just born with a heart full of neutrality? Futurama references aside, one of the big pieces of news from last week's stats was that the Arapaho were on negative 24 happiness, presumably impacted by ideological pressure, and in turn resulting in these anti-neutrality rebellions. Back towards the Philippines' former lands, real progress is being made by all parties in this war. Indonesia has Cavite El Viejo flipped to 9 pop, and Batambang in yellow still, although it seems to be recovering more than it drops now. Timor-Leste on the verge of taking Pasig, and Kokang dropping Malolos to half health with plenty of troops in position. In other news, I'm sure some of you have picked up on the implication of that new war declaration. Remember that generous peacekeeping mission Lithuania sent into Central Asia? Guess they switched jobs to peace-breaking instead, as they decided to declare war on the Masagete. I know they're hardly the toughest opponent, but looking at the composition here, I must state my doubts about the success of this plan. Tamiris isn't so weak or technologically behind that a disorganized rabble of cannon and muskets can eliminate her even with moral support from the top-tier Tuvans. Michael Collins and William III each sign a document passed around a table at a rural castle between Wexford and Cork, straddling the new border. Dutch missionaries have already converted Kilkenny to being majority Lutheran, undoubtedly with the helping hand of refugees leaving or being forced out of their homes, the Irishman refuses to even hide his venomous glare, while the Dutchman can't resist wearing a smug grin to his entourage, as all of England is officially ceded to him, at least for now. To call this war a disaster for Collins is an understatement. Ireland had a strong hand over the island for so long, but when tested beyond weak Castilian fleets, they folded up. Even worse, his troubles haven't ended with this agreement, as Tralee has clearly fallen once again to the northern naval raiders. I'm sorry to be the bearer of such bad news, Ireland fans, but I don't think the PRs can justify describing them as even simply middling much longer. In a rural retreat in the Horn of Africa, we can find some reprieve from the constant warfare and militarization that seems to define so much of the cylinder at present. A. R. Rahman, in our world one of India's most prestigious film composers and general musicians, us in the West likely know him best for his slumdog millionaire work, but he's done so much more than that, is taking advantage of this piece to develop sounds for some groundbreaking new mediums of the radio and camera. Beyond their art scene, Yemen remain in an awkward place to judge, as they have been since the early game. A squished but high-density core, tech levels just a step or so behind the leaders, a below-average army and above-average navy, and ultimately a war record that's pretty successful, but short due to passivity. Definitely one sieve to keep an eye on. The grind has been real for José de San Martín, as it now sees the Maori have more military force in his lands than he has himself. With a Kayapo Air Force and a GWI bearing down on his two mainland cities, 
I bet the elites are secreting themselves as fast as they can aboard ships bound for the South Atlantic Islands, with the fear that their leader may be joining them there soon. This slide presents a real tale of two cities, Gaborone, where a radical new band is developing a grand library of hard, raunchy, and liberated rock epics that help define Botswana as a rock and roll destination, while in Eshoe, citizens set up barricades out of rubble as control by the Zulu state is tenuously re-established before the Timorese fleet arrives again. Further along the coast, Nongoma remains dangerously in the red but seems less threatened, although Angola seems to be making a push from the west also. Irataba, by inclination a diplomat and speechmaker, can't resist the urge to visit the finest university in Ave Kwaame, and with his words paint a grand vision on the ever-growing future glory of the Mojave people to the students there when a news of a theoretical breakthrough in physics crosses his desk. For you see, as the info spreadsheet lets us see, Mojave scientists have been working to understand the very building blocks of reality and just finished researching atomic theory, propelling the cylinder for the first time into, as Irataba dubs it, the atomic age. I wonder if they'll also be the first to act upon its military applications. For any Zulu fan who felt that previous episodes haven't included enough action down here, this episode is surely delivering. Of course, one of y'all made a devil's bargain on it, so the Zulu are suffering in every shot, but that's the price. In seriousness, Yemen pieces out with Sechuayo, lacking any viable targets left anyway without first taking a good chunk of Kilwa, and who wants to mess with that superpower sieve? A small blessing, given Ishoe has flipped to Timorese forces again and looks more and more secure with them. And now Umgungunlovu even looks threatened. In case you forgot, midway through the last episode, the Wira jury declared a crusade for Mecca, a small Antarctic outpost near their island's waters. In a grand demonstration of their military competence, or more generously, perhaps a sign of how powerful aircraft can be, it seems the city has only had a fifth, maybe less, of its health depleted. Can this ragtag community with their snow-shoveled runway hold off the many frigates of the Wira jury forever? Time shall tell. Things are moving fast in this conflict, as it's only been three turns since we last checked in here, but it seems Cavite El Viejo flipped once, Malolos has fallen to Kokang, Batambang was under severe attack but has escaped capture and is in healing, and Pasig fell to Timor-Leste but has just flipped now. I'd say just about everyone in this theater is starting to look a tad more depleted, but Suharto is understandably facing the worst of it. Also, feel free to correct me if you've spotted one elsewhere, but is that the first submarine of the season south of Suai? Kaya Po, for so long dismissed as a perpetual pacifist and once a loser to the Muisca, is closing in on the Rio de la Plata capital. While there's nothing surprising about this at this point, it's worth remembering that this was the Civ ranked first when the game started, and this serves as just another capstone in how badly Jose has played his cards. I really ought to be in awe, and on some level I am. This is, perhaps, one of the most impressive Pacific Empires we've seen in the CBR outside of the end stages of a season, and mostly naturally settled. However, I can't help but think, why wasn't this grand armada sent crashing into the Kokang cities earlier, given it's just northwest of the shot? Still, it must be said that whenever the Inca want to pull the trigger, they probably have an empire waiting for them if they clash with the Maori.
Hopefully, none of you forgot about this potential war of elimination raging on as the exiled state of Tetuan persists against the Norman attempt at a Mare Nostrum run. The defense of the empire is being run on the seas by Lascarina Bubalina, a woman who knows a thing or two about running a successful naval campaign against a domineering larger empire. In our reality, she was a Greek independence fighter who commanded a fleet against the Ottomans, and after her death would technically become the first woman in recorded naval history to reach the rank of admiral, in the Russian Navy no less. We'll get back to this later, but you may want to note the health bars of the Yugoslav cities we can see here. Just a small hint. Timor-Leste grabs cities across two continents this turn, flipping Pasig and Nongoma. I can only express consideration as to whether a sieve can retake a city so many times in one episode, so I'll just say I doubt the Zulu are keeping any coastal city after the war at this rate. More humorously, it seems Seretse Kama spotted another opportunity to dunk on his regional rival, and, taking advantage of the chaos of war, has plopped down a citadel outside Nongoma. Really, Botswana should take a chance against Sechwayo at this point. Maung would be as good as theirs. As I foreshadowed a second ago, a panning view over the Brandenburg-Yugoslav War's battlefields reveal the unleashed true power of air might, as both Skopje and the pivotal stronghold of Zagreb have been blasted into the red from afar. The citizens within each city, learning the basics of ducking, covering, and bunker making on a mass scale with no reference point. Tito, as always pretty quick on his feet when it comes to military affairs, has responded to this decimation of his city defense by surging forward his forces to block any German advance, saving Zagreb for the moment. However, Brandenburg is not lacking manpower to throw at these defenders, and if only one melee unit sneaks through, the city will likely be lost. San Martin and his government evacuate westwards, along the river-fed fertile plains until they reach Tucumán, around where the Sierra de Córdoba hill lands start. Buenos Aires is firmly in Cayapo hands now, and with open land to its east and Incan troops already lollygagging in the west, this new capital shouldn't be too hard to crack either. Each day, another historic household in the city of Longbian is reduced to a shattered pile of charred wood and irreversibly fragmented ceramic. Pagodas toppled and even palaces raised as Kokang's artillery and air superiority measure up well against Han's melee advantage in a war, don't forget, that was started by the Chinese dynastic Civ. This is far from over, and Han has a track record of manifesting armies suddenly out of nowhere, but even in a best-case scenario, I struggle to see an ending where Han gains much of anything out of this whole affair. Man, peace treaties sure can come out of nowhere, huh? In one agreement, all three parties of the Rio de la Plata War agree to an immediate ending of the bloodshed. The Inca slink away with no upside at all, while Cayapo has five new valuable cities, including a game-winning capital, and José de San Martín gets to keep one mainland domain. Why would Rauni agree to such an outcome? I'd wager this is some expression of his civ's liberal nationalist ideology bubbling into policy, Sacking a helpless city of a sieve that's surely learned its lesson by now is not an expression of national values the Kayapo people want to project to the world, driving up war weariness and resistance to future combat. Whatever the case, if you thought Rio de la Plata was a near rump state before the war, you surely must think they're a full rump now. From his castle at Yoshida Koreyama, Mori Motonari sits cross-legged as the favored portraitist among his aristocracy, known popularly as Madame Lebrun, depicts him in her style, seamlessly meshing together Rococo and neoclassical techniques. 
It's a social affair that the Lord of Honshu must view as a welcome relief compared to the never-ending bickering with his Korean neighbors, or the constant reports from his northern coast regarding Gokturk attacks and movements. Oh well, at least he has a united island or two and peace at home. What more can a CBR leader ask for? Besides, you know, a military victory so they can win the game. A good bit north of Motonari's portrait session, a little bit of subterfuge has taken place. The Cree were early pioneers in using great musicians for combat effectiveness when they had Big Star rally troops against Kwakwakawaku cities with their fortitude-enhancing alt-rock anthem, The Ballad of El Strongo. However, either by force or by bribery, it seems the band has turned against their original nation and now perform for the garrison of Kalugwis from the deck of a Gokturk frigate. How treacherous! With so much military willpower put towards the securing of high-quality musicians, it's no wonder Cylinder historians will later call this era the Age of Air Waves. Get it? Because the title is about planes, but also a subversion. It's funny to me. Haha. P.S. I don't really know why great people are seemingly repeating this season, but I guess it's better than running out of names and not having any flavor after the mid-game. Just imagine them as semi-immortal, like the leaders. Or maybe reincarnations. Oh, and in terms of game analysis, I guess Zawadi is in danger of flipping again. How exciting. Somewhere in the lonely deserts that stretch out around Avi Kwa'ame sits a squat little nondescript compound. A full set of living facilities for scientists, some research and admin offices, and a barracks for the guards who were also living there, all surrounded by chain-link fences and barbed wire. For nearly five years, nearly everyone stationed here has been prohibited from going anywhere else, barring a few elites who visit and the topmost researchers who can't just vanish from the world. Two roads lead out of the facility, one towards civilization, from which army trucks arrive to resupply everything once a week, and one towards a test range dozens more miles into the desert. Just within the perimeter of the main gate, one lower-rung scientist shares a pack of cigarettes with a guard. You know we're wrapping up here, right? Just a few more weeks and everything we've accomplished here, both awe-inspiring and monstrous, will be released into this world, public knowledge. Her stare is almost vacant, drifting constantly in the direction of the test range. The guard shrugs his shoulders and gives his philosophical friend a pat on the back, reminding her, Oh, cheer up, buddy. That also means we'll be going home soon. Besides, it's not like this was forbidden knowledge. Better we study it first before someone else does. What, do you want to live in a world where those fascist Americans stomped over our culture and developed the power of the atom into a bomb first? The scientist chuckles wearily. And I wish I could have your outlook on life permanently, she responds, before taking a final drag of the cigarette and continuing. Still, it's tough to think about. You know, our research shows that it, if enough of these bombs go off in a short time frame, the entire world could be shadowed in soot and cooled down enormously. You want to feel responsible for that thought? Arming up for his shift around the perimeter, the guard simply gestures to the scorching landscape all around them and chuckles. Lady, you're asking the wrong person right now. Patrolling the Mojave almost makes you wish for a nuclear winter. Yep, I had to do all that. The Mojave had completed the Manhattan Project. I get the sense Indonesia would be gathering back some strength at this point, given the general backing off of Timor-Leste, if only Suharto was able to bring Durrani to the peace table. Instead, Afghan destroyers are keeping Surabaya in the yellow and the Indonesian fleet damaged, giving time for Zanana to regain composure if he's skillful enough. Here's a slice of the map we haven't glimpsed in a while, only tangentially relevant due to a stray war declaration on Kokang by Maui, and to highlight the roving horde of Kayapo musicians partying their way across the world. The carnival shall come to you all. Brazil has that legacy at least. 
Zuryab al-Andalusian man of many talents, including in the realm of composition and performance, puts his equal administrative talents toward leading the pack through the rich courts of Mali. This is actually our second time seeing Zuryab under Kayapo, most likely the same incarnation. How nice to catch up. From the deck of a flagship in the choppy seas off East Africa, Admiral Dagama beams with pride as he passes over the breadth of the Zulu coast with binoculars. He had been entrusted to give his nation a foothold in another continent. By Jove, has he accomplished that. Shoe maybe has some risk of falling again, but all other conquests are looking secure. Is the Afghan worker being called a workforce part of the ideology modifications or some other aspect? I'm going to presume it's some neat flavor either way. Yes, I'm choosing to talk about a worker unit named Over the War Currently Waging on this screen. That's how much of a non-starter this Lithuanian campaign is. Between the two Permian units blocking access and the fact that their armies are entirely comparable, I imagine this whole affair will get hidden under the rug in future Lithuanian curricula. A cavalry charge breaks through the final lines of defense and captures Long Bian for Kokang. No chance it stays in the Kingpin's hands, of course, given the strong melee presence around the occupied city. But hey, it's a blow against the Chinese top-tier power that proves they're on something of an even playing field. It is really quite notable how different the composition of forces each Civ has here. Kokang is going for the classic bombard a city with range and send in a horseman to finish play, while Han is just a wall of almost purely advanced melee troops. Well, I have to give this much credit to Winterdine. When given a whole episode and overwhelming naval advantage, they can bring a city in the Antarctic to zero health. Oh, wow. At least this is a good reminder that Suharto has some icy retreats down here. Two cities, according to Lax Google Maps resource, making full elimination very unlikely, even in a worst case scenario back home. On the topic of back home, Here's the current state of the campaign. Timor-Leste has a bit more mojo back, likely aided by the establishment of the Patriotic Air Force running missions out of Maliana after spending the whole episode researching flight. Furthermore, it looks like the Crimson Army is making a more definitive push on Borneo, with a greater number of infantry amassed on the island to defend Batambang and push for Bandung via land. Turkey is the second sieve this game to declare itself on the cutting edge of scientific advancement as they join the Mojave into the Atomic Age. I can't see any new unit that confirms what tech Ataturk just acquired, but we'll be sure to keep an eye on it, and should there be a pop-up about Turkey completing the Manhattan Project, one can guess. Oh dear heavens, they're here. And, of course, it's Kayapo who has unleashed this scourge upon the cylinder. Ladies, gents, and everything beyond those terms, the carriers are here in force. Dun, dun, dun! Let us all live in anxious hope that the various modifications added to prevent the worst excesses of early CBR seasons hold up this time around. Although, based on this shot, Kayapo is already trying to glue two carriers together in an experiment to create a vast supercarrier. Dear Lord, science is going too far. Long Bian is handily held in Han hands once again, and in my estimation, the division of the battlefield is returning back to the pre-war status quo. If Kokang wants to actually make gains off of this, they'll need to centralize their disparate forces at the border. But, to be fair, it wasn't Yang who declared this war, and I'm equally doubtful about Han's units pushing much further south of where they are. Prediction? Meat grinder. Mm. 
loyal proletariat, William III shouts above the roar of the crowd, stood atop a balcony at Rotterdam Town Hall. For centuries, the Anglo-Dutch nation was made to feel small, assaulted by our jealous neighbors. But we never stopped dreaming of reclaiming our deserved lands. And what did we do? The leader waved his arm outwards over the city, bathing in a response of citizens yelling, liberation, or reclamation, or simply long live the nation, things like that. Just as the crowd dies down and William goes to continue his speech, one hand catches his eye. Attached to a shabbily dressed man stood on some type of barrel. His nasal voice somehow travels far as everyone seems to hear his question. Um, excuse me, not to be a Debbie Downer, just curious, but what about Amsterdam? What are your plans there? The silence is so thick a pin couldn't even drop. It would float down and remain noiseless. After an awkward 15 seconds or so, William leans over to a blue guard captain in his protection detail. Arrest him, would you? Yep, the Anglo-Dutch have embraced a nationalistic approach to modern government in combination with their earlier choice of communism. I still think I'm misunderstanding some aspects of how ideologies are working in this game. Do correct me if I'm off. Still, what an oddball sieve. Big dreams and only moderate capabilities to make them real. Huh. I underestimated the conviction of the Cree Navy to this war, given three Gokturk cities are now around half health. Kaluguis looks pretty certain to go, which would secure Alaska for the Cree and evict the Gokturks out of North America. In the long term, the implications are even worse for the Turkic Civ. With a coastal capital, to lose all these buffer cities risks closer and closer devastation again. We've highlighted declarations into the modern and atomic ages today, but perhaps the saddest is this one. Sechwayo cutting the ribbon at a newfangled manufactory in Ulundi and proclaiming that his lands have never been more industrially modern. That may be so, but they've also never been so small besides the first episode, as every coastal city the Zulu owned now looks securely in the hands of other civs. At the very least, Timor-Leste doesn't seem to be preparing any push for the capital right now, and should probably just get a piece to build up these new acquisitions. As the finely uniformed and bearded Admiral Leif Eriksson finally steps down the ramp from his flagship and down onto the harbor of Jakarta, the prize he and the sailors under him spent years coordinating a siege for, the tension is palpable. Before him lies a hastily assembled podium to make a speech from, and in front of that podium, maybe a dozen lined up crews and squadrons standing at attention, awaiting his words. From the roofs and windows of nearby buildings, plenty of anxious Indonesian faces, once wealthy and proud citizens of a glorious capital's waterfront district, can be seen bobbing up and around for a peek at their new occupiers. Of course, this is a big risk with the guerrilla fighting out in the outskirts, but Ericsson has always liked bold actions. As he stands before the mic, prepared remarks circulating in his mind, a stray sight of green catches his eye along a nearby customs building, and he suddenly points. Whoa! What the hell is that? About a thousand or so heads swivel towards the building of the Admiral's fixation. Just another office place of some sort with some plants growing on it. Uh, some sort of vine, sir. They're not exactly rare anywhere. You've surely seen hundreds in your life, one captain suggests. The Admiral scratches his beard in deep thought. Vines, huh? What an astounding thing. Then, banging his fist down on the podium. In that case, I declare this new land Vinland. Okay, silliness done. This is a tremendous turn for the course of this season as Timor-Leste has grabbed both Surabaya and Jakarta off their inevitable rival. Even worse for Suharto, I'm not quite sure he has the resources to flip either. 
though Jakarta will be close for sure, and on Borneo, the assault on Bandung has begun in earnest. I more or less ignored those little war declarations on the Pervians from irrelevant faraway civs for obvious reasons. What are they going to do? Kill a scout or two? I forgot, however, the biggest red flag they offer is that if a random assortment of weak, distant civs are inclined towards war with someone, the chances of the next civ to declare actually being strong and neighboring always exists. That's what has happened here. As with the final fifth of slides left to go, Tuva has declared war on the Permians once again. A preliminary scan of troop positions is, uh, not hopeful for Azike, to say the least. The Permian capital of Pelim is kinda a straight walk away from capture, although Beshbalik looks to be the first Tuvan target. This war will likely do little to dispel doubt about the future success of Tuva. Wink, wink, PRs. Well, there it goes, and they're burning its population down. What a contrast of epicness between two wars here. Pretty disgraceful performance by the Wira jury, but at least Mecca is finally down. Oh, and they even have a new target, only this time with even more defense and even less cohesive an attack. Yeah, I think Al Salehi will be able to withstand this terror from down under. You know, I characterized the peace deal Kayapo made earlier as an act of mercy, but I'm sure Allende could justify this invasion similarly. It's not opportunism, it's relieving José de San Martín from the stress of rule while also giving his citizens a place under a more modern and prosperous civilization. Right? Yeah, right. However it's propagandized, the end result is the same. Unless Chile messes up bad, this could be the final struggle Rio de la Plata has to face. Given Chile has access and the military capabilities to take all three of José's remaining settlements. Just as we get two fairly important wars, another ends. The war for maritime Asian supremacy has concluded, with Timor-Leste retaining both Surabaya and Jakarta, and the city of Bandung on Borneo thrown in as a bonus to bring Guzmao to the table. With both Afghanistan and Kokang left without any straightforward borders to keep up the fight, Indonesia can now sit pretty with a cohesive four cities, plus probably the two Antarctic havens, radiating out from their new administration in the ancient Filipino colony of San Juan del Monte, although any character of its founders is decorative only after thousands of years of Indonesian control. This has been an utter coup for Timor-Leste, and their military doesn't even look entirely depleted after all of it. Robert Giscard has a fairly simplistic view on international relations. He can either invade folk or not invade folk. So many short-term advisors of his have tried to sway his mind towards other options, but it seems to him like it's all just meddling complications at the end of the day. As a result, when the problem of their inability to conquer Tetuan's last holdout came before the ruling council, Giscard overruled his ministers with a simple solution. Just invade more. Hell, Pretty Nose had been asking around for a conflict to prove to the world and her people that neutrality didn't mean pacifism. They could join in as well. Why limit the party train? No one dared suggest that declaring war on the neighbor of the place you're already struggling to access could just make matters worse, or even that declaring war on Castile would assuredly mean the enemy pillaging their underdefended lands in the south of France. Why be a downer, eh? To war! Okay, Teal Tide may not be a perfect fit for the Cree, but this fleet certainly looks to wash over Gokturk's shores as sure as the tide. While a last-minute force has appeared to defend Sat Poropet, the other two cities previously attacked have raised the Cree flag, 
and I imagine Poundmaker's intent is not to stop there. The Cree have plenty of promise, and sit upon land that has been home to many a CBR great, so securing the Bering Strait for later use, if desired, will be future-proofing of the highest level. On the southern front of the Tundra War, although that name is a slight misnomer here, Aris bears first blood in a theater of the war that is maybe slightly less stacked in Tuva's favor, but still is certainly heading their way. The Permians and Tuva formed a coalition to take most of this land off Tomyris, and the Permians spilled plenty of their own blood to expand it even further south. All wasted if all it ends up serving is a slightly better proportioned plate of food for Kular to gobble down. Things aren't doomed down here, Jaxartes especially could become a sticky spot for armies if troops head there, but Aris looks like a lock for Tuva, and honestly it's going to be hard for Azike to justify not sending every man north to protect the heartland. Not too much to comment on here, though I suppose as someone rooting against Kim Il-sung, as I'd hope most of you can similarly align yourselves, it's neat to see the Ming have landed on Jeju Island, inching slightly forward towards being able to maybe siege and take Chongjin. Still a bit of a long shot, but it would be hype. Okay. For real, Windradine? I guess the conflict for Mecca hasn't quite ended, as that one whole cavalry unit was able to promote heal up and retake the chilly city. I honestly didn't quite realize how much I disliked the Weira jury until writing this episode, but now that I've found that cranny in my brain, boy do I despise them. At the very least, this shot confirms that at least one of the Indonesian Antarctic cities Pekanbaru was also ceded to the Timorese. A shame, as it and its one tile of naval access would make a great spot to hide away from elimination. Not unlike another leader south of the equator, Saretse Khama has noted the weakness of their longtime rival. Perhaps a little later than they should have, and have jumped into action to capitalize on, well, their capital, I imagine. Being a good way behind in tech matters a lot less when your opponent is about as bad and already reeling from a knockout. So Maun should be an easy revanchist victory, and Ulundi wouldn't be too much harder, in my opinion. Kilwa would have been relevant maybe 20 turns ago, but with Umgungunlovu off the menu, the most Kilwa can do is land a few more advanced troops near Ulundi with a small snipe chance. Still, props on Ali for having cruisers when plenty of civs still have frigates. Keep up the good naval work. With little progress likely to occur in either direction, Yang and Wu sign a status quo affirming accord, bringing the conflict to an end. I think this is what you may call a tactical draw, but strategic Kokang victory. Nothing was particularly gained or lost objectively, but Kokang demonstrated that they could at least inflict a black eye on Mahan, which is a lot more than the Gok Turks could say. At the same time, Yang signs a separate accord with envoys from the Inca, gifting them Kokang's land claims on the southernmost continent as a consolation prize. Better than losing a more relevant city in the Pacific, to be sure, and Tupac must be disappointed in his naval command. Just to confirm, yep, Chan Ti Ai was very much in line to be the Inca's northernmost frontier, if only a tiny bit more force was put into the advance. Of course, I'm sure the brave pilots who sunk mission after mission into blasting at Inca ships will get the Black Poppy Award for Valor once they head back to the capital, as a hero of Kokang is owned. Donduk Kular, 
ever a top spot contender, but also a guy with cause to fear the intensity ideology can unleash on a people, has curiously managed to avoid committing his state to any principles thus far. However, with a great conflict to manage and a need more than ever to create a unifying ethos for his empire, especially if they're going to be incorporating vast swaths of land and the accompanying Permians soon. Now, communism would be the easy choice. Everyone's into it. However, for some reason, Kular has a bad feeling about that, as his theocratic and cultural sensitivities wouldn't align well with such a system. Certainly, if he was an underling in such a state, he'd end up against a wall in front of a firing squad before long, he chuckles to himself. No, his state will put itself and its Tuvan traditions first, and never lie down for another sieve to crush them. Tuva joins Timor-Leste as an outlier sieve, following an ideology just composed of nationalism. That may explain why he's sending throat singers into the front line near Kungur Tug. Who would dare stand against such imposing audio environment? Well, clearly turning to nationalism gave his troops a spring in their steps. Tuva takes both of the nearest cities on each front, Aris in the south and Beshbalik in the north, and is already well on their way with Pyrrhus. With only six slides left, I doubt we'll get any conclusion to this conflict. So, much like people were asking where Timor-Leste and Kokang would stop, I envision people to be asking the same of Tuva over the next week. In a more peaceful region of the world, Bengal looks remarkably average, even as they officially enter the modern era. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure if all of their forces were concentrated against one border, as they briefly were during the skirmishes with Afghanistan, they would be a real threat. But frankly, both of Bengal's two big avenues for potential expansion, Pandya and Indonesia, have been removed as pathways for them to achieve victory. Without any harm being done to them directly, these last few episodes have been disastrous for Bengal's chances of victory. So I hope Shujauddin Muhammad Khan has an ace up his sleeve. I don't even want to grace the wearer jury retaking of Mecca by commenting on it. As if to prove how decidedly pointless this whole endeavor was, as soon as the last hut in Mecca collapses into rubble and the Wira Jury artillery crew start to load up their pieces, peace is declared. The most famous image of the war comes at its very end, as Windredine stages a lavish welcome back parade at the Maria Kauai docks and has a frigate unveil a large banner down its side while the leader himself signals a salute on top of the deck. The banner has just two words, mission accomplished. Almost feels like this was a crusade or a holy war on part of the monastic order. See the top left corner there. Maun, founded by Botswana in the first place, was never going to be held by the Zulu for more than a few more turns anyway, its defenses already growing weary and wavering. So, with that fact in mind, why not take a chance to worsen his rival's chance in any future ventures by handing it over diplomatically to the Timorese instead? It's not like he wasn't being humiliated internationally anyway, right? And that night, even with his empire crumbling and legitimacy as a power flying away like kicked up sand, he could smile in bed, imagining the rage in Gaborone when they heard the new foreign governor of Maun told their soldiers to stop besieging his newly acquired city. Lower side, did anyone think this war with the Zulu from Timor-Leste would end up with them holding five new cities? It also leaves Botswana's troops with no targets except the Zulu capital to assault, making an elimination next episode extremely likely. I may be a Botswana fan, but still, Godspeed, such wild. The penultimate slide depicts one of the mainstays of this episode of Seabricks 3, the classic practice of the city flip. Both frontline cities from earlier have gone back and forth, 
while Pelim and especially Pyrrhus looks to fall next. Although credit must be given to the defense force being raised around them. This is something of a conflicting war on my part. I'm generally against massive Siberian blobs running away with the game in any sense, as a Tuvan victory here will help greatly. However, I much prefer the flavor of Tuva to the Permians, who have clashed with many civs I like. I know some folks enjoyed the Permians rising back up narrative, but to me it always seemed like Tuva could crush them again whenever they wanted, as they're doing now. So the only thing Azike was accomplishing is securing land against my favorites for Tuva to take off him now. It's probably a cynical take, however, and as they say, the hunt's not over until the fat bear roars. Do they say that? We conclude this week's jovial saunter through the annals of the Seabricks 3 cylinder with the opening of a modern mega project by FDR reflective of his government's strongman, semi-populist, totalitarian goals. The Prora Resort Complex is a wonderland anyone would lose themselves to simple pleasures and patriotism in, stretching across three miles of prime Cuban coastline. Luckily, only two traditional Seminole villages had to be evicted and bulldozed to make way for it. <laughs> what a break. As a reminder, for a sieve haunted by the memory of many a little dark age in the eras before its people surrendered themselves to law and order, at least that's how the present elite view it, this wonder is perfectly suited, as beyond rewarding a free social policy, the owner gains two happiness and an extra happiness for every two social policies adopted. As of our last known stats, that would mean 13 extra happiness, and I'd guess 14 by now. And since we're all having such a wonderful time, I'll say farewell from Havana Land and the past. This is Doc Ido wishing you good night from last month, and I'll see you again in five episodes later this week. <laughs>